All right. We're going to go ahead and call the meeting of the Bloomington City of, uh, Council Committee to hold the order. And Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Alderman Matthew? Here. Alderman Bowen? Here. Alderman Mwambwe? Here. Alderman Emig? Present. Alderman Painter? Here. Alderman Carrillo? Here. Alderman Black? Here. Alderman Crable? Here. Alderman Bray? Here. Mayor Renner. Here. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, uh, we do have one person who uh, has signed up for public comment, Doug Manley. Doug? If you could uh, sign in for us. Yes, please. Actually, you don't have to sign in. I've got your name here. I apologize. Okay. Um, we have a big issue in this city, and I'm sure you all are well aware of it. We had another shooting yesterday over in Tracy Drive. Why wasn't the media notified to where people would know what was going on? It happened at 4 o'clock yesterday morning. I was woke up from the eight shots that I heard. And then at 9 o'clock yesterday evening, at least 15 more shots rang out. There's no... We've got cameras right over on our, in our neighborhood, right on Tracy Drive. What, are the, what good are the cameras if they're not being able to see or to work. So I want to I want to propose something. I spoke with uh, what's your name again? Uh, Co Jen. <laughs> um, I spoke with this young lady uh, outside about a uh, if the city can mandate businesses when they're operating for profit, in which housing apartments are a profitable organization, right? Why can't they be mandated to uh, enforced to put up cameras at a certain degree to where at least there's some accountability. We know where people are, th these things are happening. We just can't catch them in the act. But there's not enough cameras. And if the apartment complexes are not willing to do this on their own, then maybe the city needs to step in and do their job and protect the citizens. That's all I'm asking for today is we Several of us over there, there's little children at 4 in the morning. I seen these little ch children out there yesterday walking down the road after the gunshots were fired in the same area. Not in a different area, but the same area. And that person could have still been out there. We don't know. And we don't know that if anyone has even been caught or even if there's anyone to be held accountable, anything. Because it, had, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't put out to the media 
until I notified WJBC this morning around 10 o'clock, 1030. They hadn't even heard anything about it. Can y'all fix that for the people? Thanks. Thank you. And just to clarify, it, it, it's our policy not to respond. Yes, I know. Yeah. Thank and you. I was trying to keep it that way, but. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's hard to do. <laughs> right. Uh, next, we move to consideration committee to hold minutes from April 15, 2019, as requested by the city clerk department. Are there any corrections or are there concerns or is there a motion? There's a, a motion by Alderman Black to move as presented. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderman Woman Carrillo. Uh, uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Alderman Matthew? Yes. Alderman Bolin? Yes. Alderman Mwambwe? Yes. Alderman Nimig? Yes. Alderman Painter? Yes. Alderman Carrillo? Yes. Alderman Black? Yes. Alderman Crable? Yes. Alderman Bray? Yes. Okay, the minutes will stand as corrected. We move right along to presentation uh, and discussion of the City of Bloomington's submission to the McLean County Regional Planning Commission for the fiscal year 2020 to 2024 Transportation Improvement Program for the Bloomington Normal Urbanized Areas requested by the Public Works Department. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Mr. Gleason and Mr. Karch, and then we've got a uh, brief council uh, period of, uh, of questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Jim, go ahead and step forward. Uh, this is our five-year uh, transportation improvement plan uh, program. Uh, Jim's going to walk through the different projects that uh, we have, and I'm going to turn it over to him. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, City Manager Gleason. Uh, Mayor and City Council, good evening. And we are going to take tonight really as an education and information session. It's going to be brief, but we're going to try to hit some high levels about what the Transportation Improvement Program is. It's commonly referred to as a TIP and what we do annually to submit this. So uh, this TIP, again, we submit it annually to the McLean County Regional uh, Planning Commission, and we do that. And what it does is it covers a series of five years of construction projects, both transportation and also transit. And so we do work with a lot of other stakeholders on this. It isn't just the city of Bloomington that does this work. This also is done by the town of Normal, Illinois Department of Transportation, Federal Highway Authority, and then also others, uh, including uh, even when Connect Transit, we have Bloomington Normal Airport Authority. So a lot of different areas uh, com combined to work toward completing this. So the spreadsheet is hard to read up there, but uh, it does include you. You have a larger copy with more details in front of you as handouts. Uh, but this is a summary of the next five years. A couple things I'd like to highlight for you is uh, the fiscal years that you see up here are different than our fiscal years. Uh, these are January 1st to June 30th. So, for example, uh, fiscal year 2020 complies and follows the federal federal calendar fiscal year that goes from July 1st of 2019 to June 30th of 2020. And so there's a lot of work coming up. And so you might say, well, this seems very weighted to one year. How is that possible? Uh, uh, council members who've been around for a long time have known we've been holding off and saving up, banking a lot of our money in the motor fuel tax fund so that we can pay cash for capital. And so at this point now, we're ready to move forward and start implementing a few different larger jobs. We get about $1.8 million a year in state motor fuel tax, and that goes toward a lot of the funding of our larger projects. And so the way this is broken down is two different areas. We talk about maintenance, and then we talk about capital projects. Up on the screen is a breakdown of our maintenance programs. Uh, recently, we approved local motor fuel tax funds. You can see up on the screen how there is some ramping up of the Im what's going toward our general resurfacing over this year and then into next year as compared with the past. And then also another thing to highlight for you is a change over the next few years in our use of motor fuel tax towards street lighting. We are phasing out the use of motor fuel tax toward the, uh, toward the payment of our street lighting costs. And the reason for that is back in fiscal year 2015, as a budget saving measure, the council adopted a budget that included changing and shifting funds from our motor fuel tax, a half million dollars, to pay for street lighting, completely allowed by state code, and it was one of those budget saving measures. We are trying to ramp that back so we can use it more for needed capital ongoing, including our roads, traffic signals, bridges, and you'll see more of that here coming up shortly. 
The next piece, so again, we had maintenance. Now we're going to get into projects. Uh, the major projects, we're just going to do a quick overview. This is not intended to get into the weeds. We're going to do a very high level hit of these projects. And I'd request that any of you that have additional questions or want more details, we're glad to get you history, current status, future. And so we just want to hit a very high level for some of this from some of these projects. So this next, this first project we'll talk about is GE at Keaton Place, Auto Row. It is a major traffic signal project that is part of a corridor improvement that we've been doing. Last year, we did Vernon and Tawanda Barnes, that traffic signal. Great improvement. We did that in conjunction with the Town of Normal. We saw quite a bit of good asphalt improvement as well. This year, including as part of this project, we're also expanding and doing more resurfacing along GE. It won't go all the way to Hershey, but it'll be between this signal and Hershey where we'll also be expanding some of our resurfacing to try to improve the street condition. This is using a lot of our motor fuel tax funds. We've been working toward uh, right-of-way land acquisition. Uh, that, a lot of times, is very difficult. It can be challenging at times to get that. So we are just about completed with that, so we, are, we feel very comfortable that this will be completed during this construction season. Next one is a longer term project that we've been working on. Uh, this is the Fox Creek Road from Danbury to the Union Pacific Railroad. There's two components to this project. There's the bridge component and then there's the street component. The bridge piece, that part of the project is 60% funded by grade crossing protection funds. We were successful in uh, achieving those funds. Now we just need to expend them. So uh, we have been working, uh, we've had difficulty coordinating with the railroad on agreements uh, trying to get across this or we'd have this project done already actually. And so that's really been a lot of the, the challenge with this project. But I can't resist. You had problems dealing with the railroad? I was oh, come on. trying to be kind. That's right. So it has been, it's been a longer term, a longer term endeavor. We're coordinating through that. But we're, we're getting there. We're, we are hopeful to actually begin uh, 2020. We're hopeful for March of 2020 is our current goal to try to see if we can hit that. Uh, the Hamilton Bund of Commerce ties in with the Fox Creek Road project and the fact that we spent $28 million already along this corridor that includes Hamilton Road, Fox Creek Road, all across the south. It is our southern east-west arterial road system. And this Hamilton Road Bund of Commerce is the hole in the donut. Many of you are very familiar with this. Over the, over the years, we've applied for fast lane grants. We've applied. We've gone to Washington, D.C. The council has passed resolutions about the importance of this project for many reasons. And one of the reasons is that this is, again, completion of that larger arterial road. Very important for us. The positive aspect is we have secured 80% federal funds for this project to go toward it. Not that 80% doesn't yet cover the railroad siding that's needed, but even that we're trying to, to get at. What I'll also let you know is that we're still not done trying to apply for grants for this project. Even though we do have, we do have that funds, those funds secured, we're trying to, even if we can free up those funds, as the city manager has said before, even if we can free up some of those funds for use in other areas, we are going to try to make an attempt to get a build grant for this as well, which would also be at about that same funding level. So we we still see this uh, from the council based upon past resolutions as a high priority and we are moving forward as quickly as we can. What I will say is you'll notice two different pieces for the funding of Hamilton Road broken up over different fiscal years. The reason for that, just to highlight that in, a different, in the past slide, is that it has to be broken up from land acquisition, right of way, some engineering work, then to the final construction project and siting work. So you'll see some differences with that, but that project is broken up over multiple years. Downtown wayfinding signing in January, uh, the council approved the moving forward with the completion of 36 signs in our downtown, including gateway signage, over arch signage that's lit, and to really encourage a lot of the ability to find and, and really promote our downtown. And so that we're looking to complete and move forward with this, this construction season. Sheridan School, we really we, we want to really celebrate the fact that we were one of only 39 organizations out of 168 applications. So 39 out of 168 that received safe routes to school funding. And so that was $200,000 that it was able to go toward with no matching funds. We were able to acquire that and get those funds. It was, that was a, a wonderful success. Uh, in the past, we have successfully coordinated as well on the Benjamin School. Uh, safe routes to school grants. So this is another another piece of that. Um, something you're going to see over the next year is starting coordinating with the different school districts on planning out those future grants of what we would want to apply for so that we can be proactive on those type of grants. 
The Jersey Avenue Bridge over Sugar Creek is a larger capital project that we've been saving up for for a number of years. Um, a few years ago, we did the Linden Street Bridge Deck. When we did that, we took to our council the fact that this is one piece of three larger bridges through Sugar Creek. And there was a decision by our council at that time to include widening of that bridge to accommodate and allow for Constitution Trail along Sugar Creek in compliance with our bicycle master plan. This bridge would do that same thing. It would have that same sort of, of, of widening to allow for the Constitution Trail to go through that. And so again, uh, the Cottage Avenue Bridge will be the last bridge. It is not in the five-year plan. We're trying to stretch the life of that as long as we can. You Bridge projects cost a lot of money, so you'd have to spread that out as best you can. And so with that being said, uh, we are we're well under our time and have plenty of time for questions. Thanks for coming in under budget, Jim. Uh, uh, questions, comments? Uh, all in the middle on board. Okay, just a quick question. So will this be available to us by email or on yes, the website? Yes, whichever po component. Can we, can we have it on the yes. website too? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, Alderman Black. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So I guess what, are, what is it you're needing from us this evening? Just a tacit approval, some feedback? I should have ended off the night the way I started. Okay, so, so tonight is just education and information. No council action is needed. Uh, in July, we will be submitting this plan for final approval to McLean County Regional Planning Commission. And so all of the projects you see, council has taken successive action so that staff is already moving forward on these. And so there is no action needed. Staff is moving forward with all of these items. This was just more also for some of our newly elected officials. And also it's good for the public. Many people, you don't see this in totality at once. So that is a, sometimes a really nice thing to be able to see the full picture at once. Thank you. I feel educated. <laughs> <laughs> all the woman Bray. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Jim. Um, so that's the one thing I wanted to comment was that this kind of overview and and this list of projects that many folks have waited on for sometimes a decade or more. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting to, uh, to our city to see these things come to fruition. So thank you for your work shepherding these through and thank you for this, this quick hit uh, because uh, we can celebrate this. I'd just like to say what, what she said. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, Alderman, uh, sorry, I'm gonna go oh, to Alderman Matthew because he's spoken already. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, can you tell me how this list, how, I mean, how does this list and the coordination of this list work with the Transportation Commission? Hmm. I mean, what's the, what does that kind of give and take look like and how does that, how do the, the two things come together? Yeah. So our Transportation Commission, a lot of that we have been dealing with different policies locally. Um, a lot of these projects are larger capital projects the council has taken action on moving to this point. So uh, many of these have been in the works for a significant amount of years. And so at this point, many of these are the culmination, as you notice, again, that large dollar figure in this coming year. Um, in the future, that can be something that, you know, can continue to be coordinated uh, and really more informational based for Transportation Commission. A lot of these larger projects are also through our, uh, really our council from a policy level. Okay. So with that then, because uh, I'm asking because one of the uh, line items that appears in every year is the um, resurfacing of various city streets, payment preservation, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And that's something we've talked about a bunch of times is, you know, it's it's the process of how roads are chosen for that mm -hmm. is still a mystery to most of the city. And so I think that um, making sure that that list of streets and how those are chosen, what order those are chosen, <laughs> having a formula of this is how we do that. You know, X percent of dollars goes to arterial and this percent goes to collectors and this percent goes to residential. And then, you know, that stack ranking process of how that happens. I think that that is something as we go forward these years, we can run that through the Transportation Commission and say, we've we created a set of rules, and with inside of those rules, here's how the roads get done. And for instance, some of it we know we're not going to repave a road that's scheduled to have sewer or water main work, right, until that's done. But um, I, I just think that there's a lot of um, mystery still that could be clarified with how roads are chosen for, right. which ones are going to be paved, which alleys, and where we're going to be at in the city. So we can let people know, because I know that all of us get questions of, well, why did you choose that road and not this road? Why did, what about that road and this road? And didn't you drive over that way? And, mm -hmm. you know, so um, 
I just think that we should we could do more to <clears throat> let people know what's going on. Right. So I didn't ask you for that softball, but thank you. It, it allows me to hit it. So in January of this year, the council approved an infrastructure solution software that the, the city has turned over all of our data. Again, we've done a lot of ratings, 1 to 10, using that PASER system. And they then take that GIS data that we've done a lot of the hard work. Our staff has done the hard work over a, a decade of preparing and doing that ratings. And so they put those into different algorithms, and you can then have the policy level decisions to say where do you want, how do you allow those decisions to take place in conjunction, as you said, with other infrastructure like our sewer, water, larger, you know, larger plans that we have. So, so that we are hopeful. We're still waiting on that to come back. We've given the data over to them based upon the council approval and action, but we really are excited. We're hopeful because we see that as a kind of that answer to the, you know, there, there's, a lot of, there's a larger amount that goes into that decision process and we see that as a, a positive. Okay. So then you do see this all that data coming back and going through Transportation Commission and then coming back to Council that way? Actually, uh, yes. Um, you know, we, we've heard Council uh, loud and clear wanting to uh, be far more aware, uh, more involved in uh, the very things that you're talking about, Alderman Matthew. So yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted, before I turn to Alderman Miller, I'm going to underscore, it can't be a mystery anymore. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that not only the council is policymaker, but the Transportation Commission is more involved in this process, regardless of what the algorithms to show us. Because at some point, we do have to take into consideration uh, human beings and their needs, uh, not just what algorithms to show us. So I'm not an, uh, I'm a numbers guy too, but uh, again, I'm just saying that we, this can't be a mystery. We can't have this conversation again. I mean, at, at this level. Anyway, so uh, all in the long way. Sure. Okay. I'm not exactly sure how I want to ask this question, but I'll go and ask anyways. So I know there is a uh, talk of a capital funding bill, right? And, and that might, uh, and that there might be some money in there for local projects, you know, in different municipalities. So I just wanted. I know it's been a while <laughs> since we've had one, but maybe you can educate us on, on the process, you know, as far as the capital funding bill is concerned, and then how this might impact this list here. I'll take this one, if you don't mind. Um, we, uh, we've submitted four projects uh, for consideration to our two state st uh, senators and our two state representatives. And uh, the Hamilton Bund of Commerce, uh, we're trying to fund this in three possible ways. The one way is uh, currently what we're doing through our uh, local MPO, where we uh, uh, target uh, FY22 to be able to start construction. But uh, of that $9 million that you see uh, uh, up on the screen, if we were successful either through a state of Illinois capital bill, uh, that would release those funds to us for other projects and our other regional partners. And also, uh, we're going to hit the, uh, the, the build uh, application process under the Trump administration. If you've heard of uh, Infra and Tiger in the past under the Obama administration, it's, it's the same thing. And uh, we're going to uh, ramp up and uh, deliver, hopefully, a, a quality application uh, and try to you know, try to uh, get this funded uh, federally as well. So uh, that does potentially uh, release those funds locally if we're successful at the state capital bill level or at the federal level with the, uh, the build uh, grant program. All in uh, Korea, all the women in Korea. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, when you were talking about the software, do you have a sense of a timeline about when that might be coming down the pipe? We were hoping to have got, already had the data um, here, you know, about a few weeks ago. So we actually just are following up, trying to find out how quickly we're going to get it. Uh, but even whenever we get the data back uh, and have it in a software, that, is, as the mayor pointed out and, and Alderman Matthew, there's still a lot that then you have to evaluate, do some QAQC. We want to make sure we go through a, a good process. And also, we have a water master plan that, that we're looking at for our water main and sewer, and there's other pieces that also, there's other facets that go into it. Yeah, I was just curious about whether you're, thinking about it's going to be a couple of days late, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, a couple of years, like what, what that sense was. 
I hate to over, I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver, but you know, we definitely want to see, we, we're hopeful, it's going to be a process for us, but we're hopeful to get the, the data back within the next 30 to, to 60 days and start processing it and, and going through Transportation Commission and others. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. All the woman, the eunuch. Um, so this is a high-level question, but I was really glad to see the Safe Streets mm -hmm. get funded for the Sheridan Schools. Are there any other similar kinds of grants in, in process in this new framework um, going forward and or ha has the city pursued um, getting funding for ADA compliant areas, more accessible bus stops, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so some of that, we do look to partner whenever we can with Connect Transit on that. We look for any opportunities we can, um, you know, just even now you know, trying to talk with Connect Transit about some of their different bus stops. But that being said, um, you know, Safe Routes to Schools has been a very effective uh, sidewalk in particular with ADA accessibility. That has been really a wonderful mechanism for us. Um, we haven't seen a lot of other funding um, that, you know, we, we have been thankful for community development, CDBG funds that you're going to hear about shortly in the past. Some of that has been used and been helpful, um, but the, the Safe Routes to School has been a real effective tool for us. Any other questions, comments? No. Just Mr. Gleason. Maybe a, a closeout comment. Uh, again, I, I know I'm saying this again, uh, but in, maybe this provides a little bit of uh, cover for uh, Jim Karch. Uh, don't know what the practice had been of the uh, city manager prior to me, but um, uh, this is a topic when we're talking about uh, spending taxpayer dollars uh, on uh, asphalt and concrete type of projects. Uh, it's been my practice that uh, I'm far more involved and uh, council is far more aware uh, and involved as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure that's music to everybody's ears who's, ears who's sitting up here. Anything else? Okay. Uh, we move right along to the next item, item six, and that is a presentation and discussion regarding the John M. Scott Commission by the Commission Chair and Vice Chair as requested by the Community Development uh, Department, Office of Grants, and we're going to go ahead and turn this over and have uh, then a brief council discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is uh, a brief uh, presentation and really an introduction of the uh, John, John M. Scott uh, Chair and Vice Chair. And I'm going to turn this over to uh, Jennifer Tony, our grants uh, administrator for the city, to uh, make those introductions. Jennifer. Thanks for allow <coughs> Excuse me, allowing us the time to give you a little bit of an overview. I know we have some new um, council members, so we'll give you a kind of a history of the commission and how the the city's what the city's role has been, and then kind of where we are with a new funding structure. So I'm going to ask you to welcome um, Holly Ambule, our chair, and Sue Grant, our vice chair. Thank you very much. Please come forward. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer, and we're glad that you invited us to be here. We know you have, have some new members, and so we'd like to, you to know a little bit more about Judge Scott and what the John Scott Healthcare Commission is all about. I've actually served as chair for the last eight years, so I'm turning the reins over to Holly, effective just a couple <laughs> weeks ago. So I'm just going to give you a little bit about the history of Judge Scott in case you didn't know about him. Um, he lived here in Bloomington and worked here most of his adult life. He was an attorney. He was a crony of Abraham Lincoln, if you didn't know that, and Mr. Gridley, as well as um, David Davis. He served on the Illinois Supreme Court. He was quite, quite a prominent um, resident of McLean County. But when he died, he was very forward-thinking, and in his will, he left a large sum of money to the city of Bloomington. That money became available when his last heir died in 1976. He, his intent was to have a hospital built, but when, he died, when the last heir died in 1976, this community had three hospitals. We still, we still had the old Mennonite Hospital, Brokaw Hospital, and St. Joe, so a hospital really didn't make sense. But I want to read you um, from his will. He directed that a portion of his sizable estate be forever under the direction and control of the city of Bloomington, making the city council the trustees of the trust. And that's why we're here. It's a sizable trust. And to be used to erect, construct, and furnish a building suitable for a hospital. His wording was very forward-thinking for his day. It was to, for the health care of all sick or disabled persons, male or female, old or young, without regard to nationality or religious beliefs, who may not be able to pay 
or this part you can kind of tell is from the 1800s, or who have no friends to care for them. We, <laughs> we don't actually use that terminology today in healthcare. Um, so actually the money was turned over to three entities, the City of Bloomington, which is the trust that we're talking about tonight. District 87 got a portion. They have a board that oversees the expenditures of it. And then also um, what's now known as Children's Home and Aid or the Children's Foundation got a portion. We have converted to an all grants format with um, the city council graciously voted that last July. And so this, this past year has been a time of transition. So I'm going to turn it over to Holly. Holly is our new chair and she's going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing over the last year and where we're headed. Thank you. Um, so hi everybody, I'm Holly Ambule and I've been on the commission since 2015 in various capacities but am new in the chair role. And, big shoes to follow and there's a lot of people who have been working really hard on this transition. Some of you that have been in, <laughs> in your chairs for a while and well acquainted with the issues so I don't want to belabor them but we do think it's important for the new members of this council to be familiar because there is going to be most likely more attention to this because of the size of the RFP that's coming. So that's really why we want to dedicate some time to this today. So the commission was also set up in the original declaration of, cross, of trust to advise you as the trustee um, about how to spend the money in the trust and we're limited to spending no more than 5% of the corpus um, like most trusts um, kind of operate by that benchmark. But with and that our job is to come to you with recommendations about how to do that and that's been true always. Um, along the way there's been different administrators so it began at the city and then an IGA was created in the 90s where the um, city kind of punted administration to the township and now it's returned to the city via Jen, like it or not. <laughs> Um, and we're really thankful she's been working really hard um, to get everything underway and it, it gives us a good opportunity to leverage some economies of scale because she'll be able to use grant software that you guys are going to also use for the CDBG and one more, I forget, but so we can share, the, the trust can share the cost of the software with the city and so there's lots of advantages with that infrastructure. Um, I want to make sure I don't use up too much time and save time for questions, so just give me a second here. Um, so the funds um, traditionally were, or were intended to be used for the hospital and since that wasn't relevant, um, that's what helped create the Scott Health Resources Center, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, um, even the new, new members, um, and it, which is still there. Um, and so what we saw happen after the passage of uh, the Affordable Care Act was a lot of people in our community that normally would walk in there for direct services because they didn't have coverage were able to get services elsewhere at various places in our community. At least that's our theory because the volume was so dramatically less after that. So, you know, going from, you know, hundreds of people to maybe a dozen a month or whatever with some variation. Some of the persistent needs that we're seeing are mostly around transportation. Um, and oral health um, and some meds. So there are some lingering needs, but a lot of those people are now covered elsewhere. So what that did was change the, kind of flipped the um, direct services and administrative um, portions um, in a way that didn't make sense anymore. And so that's really what was the impetus for bringing the trust administration back to the city. So um, that's kind of three years of history in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> and I know you guys, you know, can talk amongst yourselves about that. Um, the older members can educate the newer ones on that. Um, so mo moving forward, a lot of things will be different. Um, one, we're moving to an online-based open and transparent grant system, which will be the first time that that's happened. In the past, it's kind of been behind the scenes. There wasn't as much money. Um, you do have a five-year funding history in your packet, I believe, so um, you can kind of see how it was hovering between one and um, $200,000 in the past on an annual basis to just a limited number of recipients. Because of the activity in the stock market, and reduced administrative expenses and kind of delayed action over the past few years, there's more money available. So the commission has budgeted $450,000 for fiscal year, your fiscal year 20. So that's already been approved. Um, the prior council already approved our new grant policies and procedures, so that's already in your packet. So you'll see that there's gonna be several um, categories of grants moving forward. Um, and because there's more money, um, the people that are accustomed, the organizations that have received money in the past, 
there's still plenty of room for them at the table along with some new organizations potentially to come on board, which is a really exciting opportunity. So it's nice to be here and give you good news. <laughs> um, I think it's a great opportunity because there's so much need in the community. So um, one of the things we wanted to make sure you're aware of is that the, and, and some of these pieces are still being vetted by the commission and we're still implementing processes and figuring out how it's all gonna work. But one of the things we've been, we intend to do is tie the funding to the uh, McLean County Community Health Improvement Plan. So I don't know if you all are familiar with that. If we can talk, if not, we can talk more about that. But that's a joint plan that's heavily vetted, consensus-based, um, and is the, the plan that the hospitals and the health department are required to do. They have different cycles, but for the first time in 2016, they worked together to create a single plan. And there's no dedicated local funding for that. So our intent is to ask applicants in this RFP that's going to come out this summer to pick one of the goals in that plan and write to that. Um, so we're excited and we've talked to the team that does that plan about that. They're excited. <laughs> um, so that's at a high level um, one of the guiding principles under this new model. Secondly, we're going to honor Judge Scott and his commitment to equity and forward thinking and ask them to target health disparities in our community. There's lots of special populations, neighborhoods, zip codes that have very disparate outcomes and we're gonna ask people how they intend to address those disparities in um, a very specific way. We'll also allow people to write to the social determinants of health, which basically is kind of a wonky term that um, is intended to portray that health begins where people live, work, and play. And there's a lot of really good research in the field um, about that right now. Kaiser Permanente did a huge study on this. Um, so a lot of healthcare in general is moving in that direction. And a lot of healthcare funders are moving in that direction. So it allows people to pitch ideas that aren't traditionally healthcare services. If you can demonstrate how targeting those will improve health outcomes. So there's things we know that are highly correlated <laughs> to good or bad health. Um, and so that includes things like transportation, housing quality, et cetera. So there's a lot of research on that and I can definitely provide more information. It's very broad. Um, so we've spent a lot of time working with community stakeholders on this. So um, it shouldn't be much of a surprise to most people that will be affected by it. We've tried hard to make sure it's transparent and then we're planning well and we're still open to some feedback. So if you guys have questions, we'd be happy to field those. And Sue, you can, and Jen, if they have questions that you are better <laughs> to answer, please come back up. So I'll stop there and um, we'll keep you guys posted because there's still a lot of work to do. So when it's appropriate, we can come back, um, whether it's in this setting or another and or meet individually, whatever's helpful. But I do think because this, the, well, it'll be higher profile than it's been in the past, so it's important that, that we're, we keep you engaged. Okay. All the woman painter. Well, first off, thank you so much for keeping us up to date on these changes. Um, I have a question that maybe doesn't pertain so much to John M. Scott, but I know that uh, oral health is a great need mm -hmm. in our community. How do people get dental services that really need it here? Well, Sue could probably write a dissertation on this. <laughs> um, so um, I'll invite her up. But there are, that is a um, quickly changing environment in our community. So the answer to that three years ago would have been different than today. And in three years, hopefully, it'll be different again. Um, there are, um, spaces that have been created at the community health care clinic um, and they started offering services in March. Um, and Chestnut also has created space in their new FQHC to, for up to eight dental chairs, but right now it's empty awaiting federal grant money. Um, so there's providers that are positioned to start doing more, but not meeting the need yet. So, and then I'll yeah. let Sue. 
oral health kind of was my passion at the yeah. health department. I was the supervisor of the dental clinic for a very long time. The health department is, was originally the only clinic in this county who accepted people with a medical card. That's changed. There's some private, I, I shouldn't use the word private, they're what I call corporate dental offices. Probably not someone I would recommend, but they do take the medical card, so people have more opportunities. It is one thing John Scott used to pay for, but we were only serving about three people a month, so it still didn't, it, the administrative costs were still too great. I will tell you, I, I'm now at Illinois State University and we're teaching nursing students more about oral health and we're doing toothbrushing in schools with nursing students taking the lead on that. So prevention is always cheaper than treatment. So if we can start at that level, that's where we're working as a community. And hopefully um, with the new plan, the new community health plan, they have also will include oral health again and we'll be able to continue to work on that. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously a very critical thing throughout all the states, and yeah. some some provide them. Illinois used to actually provide that, as you probably know, I think until 1995. And uh, speaking of someone who didn't go to a dentist until he was 21 years old, <laughs> I can tell you that that's a, a very important thing for prevention. I can tell you, is, <laughs> oral health is the largest unmet health care yeah. need in the entire yeah, country. It, we just, yeah. it, was not, it was not in the cards. Right. My mother and didn't have the money. No. So yeah. my, my master's project was the integration of oral health and primary care with, with the belief that if our primary care providers were also paying more attention, we wouldn't have the problems that we have today. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much yeah, for that. Uh, all in the middle of way. Okay. Well, thank you so much for all the hard work that, you, that you've done on this, uh, uh, on this grant process. I, I know it it wasn't always easy. It took us a while to, to, to get there, but I'm I'm really happy to see that we've uh, we've come to something that's uh, um, that seems to be acceptable for all and it's it's gonna yield great benefits I'm pretty sure. I wanted to ask about the RFP process. So um, first of all I wanted to know how much you're going to publicize it to make sure that there's awareness um, but also, it's kind of a two, three part question. Um, are you confident that there will be a, a great response? And if, um, what if there are gaps that are, you know, needs that are not met? Uh, what do we plan to do about it? You know, if people don't respond basically to some of the, uh, the elements of the plan that you're, you're, you're thinking about? Um. Well, thanks for the opportunity to comment on that. That's um, a series of actually pretty complicated questions, so I'll do my best. But um, in terms of publicity, well, first of all, I think we've been doing a lot of behind the scenes talking about this. So the agencies that have already been at the table with this trust are, know it's coming. Um, we did a round table last fall with them, picked their brains, asked them what they wish funders knew. And we have a lot of information we can share with you in more detail about what we learned from that process was highly instructive. Um, and in my work professionally, which is separate from this because these are volunteer roles from us, I spent a lot of time talking to nonprofit leaders and I've made sure they know this is coming. Um, so I do think, and I know um, even schools and certain leaders that are talking about how to prepare. So what we've been telling people is make sure you're familiar with our county, our community health improvement plan. Um, and that you brainstorm ideas so you're ready to go. Um, I would imagine after tonight, this being a public setting, that it will generate some <laughs> publicity in an official capacity. And then as we're, as we're ready um, with documents that have been approved by the commission, Jennifer will work to make sure they're on the website. So your city website now has a more robust page related to the trust and the commission. And we're gonna be building that. So all of the policies and procedures and the portal for applying and all of that will be through that web page on your site. Um, so we'll be able to issue a press release and point people to that. So we do have a plan to kind of um, make it more widely known, but um, in terms of the response on the second part of your question, I can tell you the needs in this community are so great that I think we're going to get more applications than we, um, that we're going to have a, a difficult time. I'll be surprised if that doesn't happen. It could happen, but I, you know, I, there's, it's a difficult environment here after changes at the state and at United Way, and it's just been a really difficult few years. P agencies have taken a lot of hits, so um, I think that people, our goal is to be flexible and in a learning mode. So we write an RFP that's um, 
really good, but also <laughs> allows people to be creative. Um, that way we can learn from what's proposed, what the needs are, and figure out how to make them fit. Um, or, you know, if we, one of my goals as chair is to, to work better with other funders here, right? So we ask agencies to collaborate. I would like our local funders to model that. <laughs> so um, if we can work together more to trade good ideas, like, I can't fund this, but you might be interested, that kind of thing, um, and make sure the community understands who to go to for what. Um, I think there's a lot we could do better with that. So um, there's lots of opportunities. If we um, have gaps and we get, you know, 100 oral health proposals and nothing over here, then I think we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I, um, we're, because this is a completely new situation, we're not really sure what to expect, and so that's why we want to be flexible and stay nimble. So we, when we rewrote the bylaws and the trust, we tried to be as, make language that was flexible so that we could adapt, because we're not really sure what's going to happen. So I think it will be educational for all of us. Does that answer your question? <laughs> There's definitely a lot of unknowns. Right. That was actually a really good answer. Oh. <laughs> Alderman Matthew and then uh, Cravel. So um, thank you guys for coming in and presenting this. Um, I, I wanted to say that you know when we, we put the new bylaws in place, one of my favorite components of this was the um, emphasis on reporting results. Um, because I know that that has not always been important in the past and okay. so now it's in the bylaws that it is this is something that we require to make sure that um, anything that we do fund we're we're seeing the results that we want or at least um, uh, you know we're aware of what worked and what didn't work so that we can make educated decisions going forward um, and and I love looking at the five-year plan and seeing the increased support for um, the psychiatry services because you know we've had a series of articles in the media over the last year about the um, lack of services in general for the entire community but especially for our other underserved populations so um, thank you for um, putting those in the grants and then uh, with the dental as well you know there, I saw a random quote that somehow 20 plus bones in the body were determined as not important so along the way to the insurance providers and so I like to see that we're making those bones important once again, um, you know, uh, because they say that um, uh, so a person's smile is the number one um, identifier for social economic status, Absolutely. right? So yeah. thank you for all the work that you're doing, and I really appreciate it. You'd be surprised, uh, one of the things that I do at uh, Illinois Wesleyan in my methods class is percentage of the population that's toothless is surprisingly correlated with all kinds of things at a statistically significant level. Now, obviously, that's not the direct cause. It's, it's something else. But it's, uh, I usually do it just for mindless empiricism as an example. But, uh, but it does reflect a broader uh, poverty and other you know, factors. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, Alderman uh, Crabill. I would also like to thank you guys uh, just for the education. It's, it's, uh, I've learned a lot. And I just have a couple of questions to help me f further educate me. Um, so we talked about health outcomes and helping improve that. Is something like that part of, like, say, um, a food desert and helping to improve something like that? Um, yes. <laughs> um, so I didn't mean to limit the concept to only transportation or housing because I'd be happy, I'll follow up with some of the research, but we can give you some um, graphics that show the social determinants of health. And what the research shows is that there's certain things that are so highly predictive of health outcomes that um, they matter more than what happens inside the healthcare system. Um, and that's true for things in the built environment um, where you have access to recreational activities, green space, um, the ability to exercise. Um, it matters when you have transportation or not in order to get to a point where you can receive primary or emergent care. Um, and for people that have odd working hours that you know prevent them from doing things during the business hours, like those access barriers, um, whether or not you have childcare while you can go take care of your healthcare needs. Um, the the field of child trauma is very important in this, um, and that's a separate body of research, but what it says is that if all children are likely to experience trauma 
at least once because life is hard. <laughs> but whether or not you have protective and restorative factors in place when you experience trauma matters. And um, it also matters how many of those traumas you have. So if a child witnesses domestic violence, has an incarcerated parent, and sees drug use in the home, um, and their parents get divorced, that's the kind of child you're going to see more likely to not just have their own issues as an adult, maybe in the criminal justice system, but also literally be unhealthy. So it's very highly predictive um, of adult health. It's really fascinating. So that's based on a 30-year study that Kaiser Permanente did and published in like 2011. So those are the kind of issues we want to see people thinking about in our community. How can we target those things to help people experience more well-being and health? Thank you. Anything else? Thank you very much, and thank you for all you do. We very much appreciate it. Thanks. Can you, can you share oh. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I was going to say, be great. I've been yeah. taking notes. So all. What's the best way to do that? Should I send it to Jennifer? Yeah, yeah. You can. OK. Yeah. Then it's all on Jennifer's shoulders. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. OK, thanks again. At this point, uh, our last item is I'm going to turn this over for uh, five minutes to our city manager. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I won't need five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> I do have a handful of items. Uh, just a reminder to uh, the community, uh, Memorial Day is next Monday. City Hall is closed. So that means our council meeting is on uh, Tuesday, uh, May 28th. Uh, also uh, effective, our target is May 28th. Uh, the new uh, name tags, uh, name plates for uh, the council members will be uh, completed. Uh, we're just waiting on one more response before we uh, send out the uh, order for all the things related to uh, the names uh, for this council. Uh, also, the first week of uh, June is our targeted uh, go-live date with the uh, streets uh, website uh, that we've talked about in the past. Uh, so that's the, uh, the goal, and uh, we'll have more on that uh, May 28th. Also, uh, agenda items that uh, I know will be on the May 28th agenda under the regular uh, agenda items. We have uh, the AFSCME uh, Local 699, who also represent the library employees, a contract that will come back uh, before council for approval, very similar to uh, the contract that was negotiated with the uh, city employees uh, and AFSCME uh, Local 699. Also, we're going to have uh, consideration approving the boundaries for the downtown cultural district, a cultural map that we've talked about. And we actually have uh, two members uh, on the uh, Cultural Commission, uh, Alderman uh, Matthew and Crable. Uh, so we'll have that on the agenda as well. And then lastly, uh, Bob Mart uh, and his team uh, were successful in getting a $100,000 grant from the Illinois Housing Development Authority's Home Accessibility Program grant. It's not something that we've uh, received before, and it will come before council for approval uh, next Tuesday night. That'll do it for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And then uh, for the new council members, we if you're coming for the Memorial Day Parade, we gather right in front of the Law and Justice Center and uh, we'll figure out a way back either by walking or by uh, some version to come back to uh, to the law and justice center if you're if you're walking and there is no candy because of the nature of the parade there's a parade with candy and uh, labor day uh, the nature of the solemnity of uh, memorial day is such that uh, they ask us not to to provide candy so um, with that is there a motion to adjourn moved by Alderman woman bray is there a second second uh, several seconds. Uh, second by Alderman Vander. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thanks. <laughs>